Welcome back for part two of chapter five. We'll go ahead and jump right on in. I believe it was page 52 that we're going to on this. We had just finished up using the for loop. And now we're going to talk about keeping a running total. Now, uh, what we're doing now is kind of showing an example of uh, something you may do using uh, a typical loop. And this is keeping a running total. So the running total is accumulated sum of, of numbers from each repetition of loop. To do this, we're going to have an accumulator, which is a variable that holds that running total. So in this example, we have int sum equals zero and num is one. Sum is the uh, accumulator. So as we are going through our loop, the sum is what's going to continue to hold the, um, that, the sum of each repetition. So the logic of that is we set that accumulator to zero we then say, is there a number to read? And yes. Then we're going to read the number and add that number to the accumulator. And then go back up to the loop. Is there a number to read? So forth and so on until we run out of numbers, we fall through the loop, and we have output. All right. So this is a running total in program 512. It's just an example. It's pretty straightforward. Um, let's see here. We've got a uh, number of days and our accumulator is going to be this total. And the application is going to say, for how many days do you have sales amounts? And it's looking for a number of days. And then it gets the sales for each day and accumulates total. So what it's going to do is it's going to loop through this and it's going to start with day one and go through the number of days there were sales with the incrementing of the count uh, counter. Uh, so this count is actually a counter. Uh, it's going to then say, enter the sales for the day, uh, for the first day, um, and so forth and so on. We're gonna enter the sales, and then it's going to take that and add it uh, to the accumulator of total. That's gonna keep our running total. At the end of that loop, it's gonna display the uh, final values, and uh, we can see that with the fact that we're telling C out to do a fixed show point with a precision of two, because it is dollars and cents, and then we are going to show the total. Sentinels. All right, so uh, yeah, sentinels. Uh, you might be thinking this kind of sentinel. Uh, not exactly. I mean, I guess it's kind of kind of the same because, you know, it does, uh, in the matrix, uh, uh, it is the end. Oftentimes, it's the end of someone's life and ship and all that good stuff. So kind of maybe kind of represent that. But uh, uh, for us, Sentinels is a way to uh, distinguish the end of data. And it's a value that will be in our data to say we have it hit the end of data. Now, oftentimes, most often, you're going to be working with positive numbers. And if that's the case, one of the easiest ways to indicate the end of data is by terminating it with a negative 1. And negative 1 would be a sentinel. In fact, this application is exactly uh, do, it actually does what we just talked about where we have negative 1 as our sentinel. So in this, we're going to enter the number of points your team has earned for the so far in the season then enter one negative one when finished there it is that negative one is that sentinel enter the points for the game and uh and now we're asking for the points we're going to go into a while loop and when uh the points are given to us as long as it's not negative one which would indicate the end of our points and by the way the way we set this up with the while loop this is a um, loop that um, does pre-processing. So it, in here you can see this whole, this portion of our code is the uh, uh, the loop prime. We're priming the loop. And if the user on the very first input were to put negative one, 
then we wouldn't even do the while loop and we would actually come to the bottom here and output the total points are zero. Once we're in the while loop, we are now going to keep our running total, how many games, and then we're going to ask our question again. Enter the number, uh, the points for the game, whatever game we're on. And then we're asking for those points. And if the user hits negative one this time, then again, it will stop here, fall through the while loop, and do our total for us. So in this case, negative one is our sentinel. And here's an example of what we could have entered in for this practice example. So which loop should we use? We've talked about three of them so far. The while loop is a, condi is a conditional pretest loop, which means it's going to always do the, uh, it's going to do the expression first. And then if the expression is true, it will go ahead and drop into the actual loop portion. And it iterates as long as a certain condition exists. This is great for validating input, and it's also great for reading lists of data terminated by a sentinel. The do while loop is a conditional post test, which means it's always going to iterate at least once. So this is great for a repeating menu. Um, in fact, I will tell you that the do while loop is just not often used. It's not used um, nearly as much as maybe it could be, but you're just not going to see it a lot um, because we're pretty comfortable with the while loop and we're pretty comfortable with the for loop. Uh, and that's just how it kind of goes. But but do whiles do exist. The for loop is a pretest loop, just like the while loop is, but it has the abilities for expressing initialization, testing and updating all in one line. This situation uh, uh, where the exact number of iterations is known. And that's where for loops are really handy. Nested loops. So nested loop is nothing more than a, a loop that's inside of a loop. You have an inner and you have an outer. Now you can have nested nested loops and nested 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 loops. You can keep nesting uh, as much as you want. I will tell you um, nesting loops tends to be frowned upon. And the more nesting you have within your nested loops, the more it's frowned upon uh, because of the, um, the number of, of loops that will occur because every inner loop is going to run its entire set of loops for every outer loop it, it, it encounters. So that's why, to be honest with you, a lot of companies don't like nested for loops. And most of them will have it to where... Uh, you can only do um, one nested loop within a loop. So that way you're not getting into uh, quickly having runaway loops that aren't truly runaways, but there's just so much processing that has to occur for every uh, inner loop to the outer loop uh, that they just don't like it. So oftentimes two is, uh, is the magic number. The com your companies will say, yeah, you can do a nested loop, we don't prefer it, but you can't do more than one inner loop. Here's an example of your uh, of a nested loop. And remember, this is what we're saying is for every one loop of this, this loop is going to run the number of loops it needs to run. So let's say uh, num test is 10 and um, num students is 10. Then that means that this is going to end up running a hundred times plus the ten, this loop will hit and do its thing 10 times because this is going to run 10 times for every one of these so 10 times 10 equals a hundred loops for that inner circle some notes on nested loops the inner loop goes through all the repetitions for each repetition of the outer loop, which we just talked about. The inner loop repetitions complete sooner than the outer loop. And the total number of repetitions for inner loop is the product of number of repetitions of the two loops, which is easy to figure out if, like in our previous example, we had a um, very defined uh, number of loops. Um, if your number of loops is coming from 
some math or some data or some input, then you may not necessarily know um, how many times your loops are going to run. And that's where you really do start to run into problems because what if somehow your inner loop needs to run a thousand times uh, for every uh, time the outer loop runs? You could really start getting into messy, messy situations. And finally, we're going to start using files for data storage. Using files for data storage, you can use files instead of keyboard, monitor, screen for program input and output. And to be honest with you, as programmers, you know, that's kind of the key at some point is it's great being able to start up a program, get some data, do something with it. But as soon as the program finishes, the data is gone. We want to be able to, st to save data to files, and we want to be able to read data for files. That's what really makes our programs start to have a life of their own. So we can use files instead of keyboard, and we can allow data to be retained between program runs. The steps are, we're going to open the file, we're going to use the file, which means we're going to read from, write to, oftentimes do both, and then we have to close that file. So to do this, what's needed? You are going to need the fstream header uh, file for file access. File stream types is ifstream is for input from a file. This is uh, of is for output to a file. And fstream is for input from or output to a file. We always recommend that if you are only doing one of these, if you're only doing input or if you're only doing output, make use of the correct um, file stream. If you are going to do both, then you can use fstream. Uh, fstream has a little bit more uh, weight to it, and so that's why, uh, you know, especially a lot of times we're just reading input from a file. If that's the case, just use the if stream um, because that's going to be faster and perform better than the f stream. I will tell you though, uh, oftentimes you're going to find that people will use the f stream because it's quick and easy, and down dirty, um, even though there's more overhead. So to defile, define the file stream objects, if stream, uh, in file, and off stream, output file. It's very similar to int and boolean. Instead of int and boolean here, we are actually going to be saying if stream or off stream. Now we want to open the file. So we want to create a link between the file name outside the program and the file stream object, which is inside the program. Using the open member function, we're going to say our object, or excuse me, our object name dot open and the path to the file, or same thing with the out file, which is our object name dot open, our variable name dot open, and we're going to then specify the file we want to write to. File names may include drive and path info, and oftentimes we recommend that. Output file will be created if necessary. Existing files will be erased first. And it will not ask. It will just do that. So be careful when you're using that, uh, that uh, off stream. Input files must exist for open to work. Well, that just makes sense. If there's not a file there, it's not going to open. Testing for file open errors. So you can test a file stream object to detect if there's any opening uh, operations that failed. Uh, and this is what we're going to do in this example. We're opening test.txt, and we are saying if not in file, which is saying if the in file um, doesn't exist, if the if it's pointing to basically null, uh, then uh, there was some kind of open failure. You can also use the fail member function as well. Um, it will give you something very similar. Now we're going to use that file. Can we can uh, can use output file objects in our uh, that is our less than less than uh, to send data to a file. So here we have out foot out file less than less than inventory report. So we're we're actually writing that literal inventory report to our output file. You can do the reverse to uh, copy data um, from files to your variables. So here we have that in file object and we're going to take the data and we're going to put it into part number. Uh, you can do that um, if there is several pieces of data, you can also specify several variables. 
this is where our loops really come in handy because oftentimes we want to read a lot of data um, from a file. So the stream extraction operator greater than greater than returns true when a value is successfully read or false otherwise. You can use this in a while loop to continue execution as long as the values are read from the file. So here in our expression, not only are we putting something from the file into a variable, this operator is going to tell us whether it was true or false if there was data. So if it's at the end of the file, it's going to obviously not be able to put anything in here, but it's also going to then return false. And that's good because since there was no data return, we don't want to go into our loop. Finally, we need to make sure we close our files. Use the close member function of the object. So in file.close, out file.close, you know it's a uh, member function because we have to put the parentheses. Thought I had my pin there. Because we have to put the parentheses. That's how we know. So the parentheses are required. Don't wait for the operating system to close the file at the program in. Uh, Maybe limit, uh, there may be a limit on number of open files and maybe buffered output data waiting to send to the file. In simple terms, um, sometimes people get lazy and they just end their program and then they expect the operating system to do all the work for them. Well, you can't, one, guarantee that the operating system will do those things and you definitely can't um, uh, guarantee when it's going to do those things. So... You may have a file that you have open that you've written data to, but it actually is in the buffer and has not output to the file. And um, just killing your application uh, could cause problems. The data may still be buffered and not output yet. So you should do the work. Make sure you out close your file so that way your streams are buffered, uh, put out, and you don't have a file that's just sitting open for a while while the OS figures out when's a good time to close it. Letting the user specify a file name. So in many cases, you're going to want the user to specify the name of a file for the program to open. In C++11, you can pass a string object as an argument to a file stream object's open member function. So here is an example of us just doing that. We're actually asking the user to enter the file name. And with that, we are then going to uh, open the file using the variable that we've stored the file name into. Using the C underscore star, uh, excuse me, C underscore string member function in older versions of C++. So if you're using something uh, prior to 11, the open member function requires that you pass the name of the file as a null terminated string, which is also known as a C string. Also C underscore string. String literals are stored in memory as null terminated C strings, but string objects are not. So if you create a, create a string uh, object and put a string into it, those are not null terminated, and so it's not a C string and will not work with prior to uh, C++11 and the open members. So how do you use that C string member function in older versions? The string objects have a member function named C string. It returns the contents of the object formatted as a null terminating C string. So just when you set up your string object and you go to use the open, you're going to use string object, whatever your variable name is for the string object, dot C star, and it's a member, so you'll need those parentheses. And this will return that object as a C string, which is null terminated. And this is an example here in line 18 on our uh, program 524 could be rewritten in the following manner. If we were using something uh, that was a little older in C++, we would have to use that file name dot C star to get the C star, uh, excuse me, star, I keep saying star, C string, uh, version, the C string version of that um, string. 
So breaking and continuing a loop. Breaking a loop allows you to terminate execution of a loop. So you may need for a special reason to break out of a loop um, in the middle of the loop without uh, really any more expressions being um, read uh, for the loop. Use it sparingly, if at all. Makes code harder to understand and debug. And uh, definitely, if you're going to do that, we always recommend adding code comments to why you've done that. Because it is a uh, what's kind of considered a unique situation. So you want to make sure you comment it. When it's used in an inner loop, it terminates that loop only and goes back to the outer loop. This is really important to remember. A lot of people uh, kind of mess this up because uh, they want to terminate all the way out to all out of all the loops. Um, to do that, you're going to have to add some logic to uh, maybe use make use of some flags to do so. Uh, but you're, uh, when you use that um, break, you're only going to break out of the existing loop. The continue statement. Use the continue to go to the end of the loop and prepare for the next repetition. This oftentimes feels similar to the break, but it's not. And the break, there's no more loops that are going to happen. It breaks out of the loop. Where the continue says, wherever that statement is, the continue, hey, stop doing this iteration of the loop and start the next iteration of the loop. So this is great. Uh, if you come up on a reason to skip the rest of the code that's in the particular loop you're in, but you don't want to break out of the loop, so you're going to use a continue instead. Just like the break, you should use it sparingly because it does make the logic harder to follow. Again, code comments. So that is it on Chapter 5. Um, it was quite a bit to take in. Uh, it's one of those chapters I recommend just getting into uh, your... Um, your homework and practicing, uh, make some for loops for yourself, uh, create some uh, runaway loops even um, that you're going to have to break out of the actual program. Control C oftentimes does that for you uh, on the PC side of things. Um, but, you know, play with your loops, get used to your loops. Uh, make sure you're using if, else, if, uh, and if, else statements inside your loops uh, to practice those. And that's just how you'll get better at using loops um, and understanding how they work. If you've got any questions, make sure you email me and I will respond to you. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you next week.